Now, it does me great pleasure to get to why we're here today, which is to recognize um, a person that is a great practitioner in this space. I admire his work tremendously. And so I am just honored that he said yes to our invite. And as I normally do here on Intentional Conversations podcast, I want to provide a formal introduction. Then I will invite Farzine to unmute himself and share and greet this audience in his own way. Farzee Farzad is an organizational justice practitioner with experience in higher education, local government, and the private sector, holding two master's degrees in international affairs and diplomacy, as well as a certificate in conflict resolution skills. Farzine leverages his unique academic background, extensive travel experience, and experiential knowledge to provide comprehensive thought-provoking local and global approaches to his work. In addition, in addition to training and education programs, Farzine is a seasoned program project manager with expertise in developing strategies that build equitable workplace environments and government services, as well as employee resource groups, ERGs for short, events and programs. Farzine is the founder of Critical Equity Consulting LLC, which is a boutique organizational justice consulting firm focused on helping organizations rebuild with a primary focus on creating equitable outcomes. I can tell you that from the pre-show conversations that took place, this is going to be a really rich conversation. The hour will go by fast, so hang on to your seats. Listen intently because there's something for everyone here to walk away with. I think it's going to make us better than how we showed up to this conversation. So Farzine, in your own way, just unmute yourself and provide some additional insight for this audience into who you are, your DEI story. What do we not know about you from having heard your bio? that um, you are willing to share. And welcome, uh, by the way, welcome. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Nika, and thank you for having me. This is, a, this is wonderful, and uh, I've been looking forward to this conversation for, for quite some time. So um, a little bit about, about me. Uh, I come into this work, I think, uh, and, and probably you know the reason why I think I specifically chose, and we can talk about this organizational justice, because I come into this uh, work from doing human rights work. And so like I, um, I, in my 20s, I did a lot of work with my own ethnicity. So I'm ethnically Azerbaijani from Iran. And, uh, you know, I'd gone to the UN Minority Rights Forum. I'd been an advocate for um, cultural and linguistic rights for my own ethnicity. And that gave me the opportunity to kind of understand uh, quote unquote, the minority rights um, sector in the Middle East and eventually kind of built relationships and, um, and, and kind of did some more advocacy work throughout. Um, I kind of entered the field haphazardly. I uh, traveled a little bit when I came back to the US. Um, I just uh, kind of fell into a job doing uh, talent acquisition in uh, a local university here in the DC area. And, um, and kind of, uh, you know, at, lobbied for myself a little bit because there was a lot of transferable skills, um, moved into uh, uh, doing DEI work and then did it for corporate and then did it for local government. And then finally I started my firm uh, last year with the idea of aggregating a lot of this experience and, and basically um, being able to kind of address some of the gaps that I saw um, over time and, and take a very human centered approach to, to this work. Um, uh, particularly with, uh, and we can talk about this, but it's particularly with the um, idea that um, kind of expanding diversity, equity, and inclusion to include uh, um, a lot of conversation around, uh, you know, material well-being, labor rights, et cetera. Um, and so that's, that's where I'm at right now. That uh, defines my shift from DEI to organizational justice. But um, a kind of long story short, you, you hear a lot of uh, you know, language around social justice that I use, and that comes from that particular human rights background that I, that I had in my, in my 20s. And so like uh, my whole thing is, you know, I spent a lot of time um, uh, researching uh, philosophical relationships with labor, um, and I, um, I kind of wanted to operationalize that uh, here. No, I love that. I love you sharing kind of a little bit of your history and your story and your journey to where you are today. 
I want to unpack organizational justice a bit further. I realize that in this broad space of diversity, equity, and inclusion, belonging, accessibility, and you can add so many other words, you know, to that, that um, there are so many practitioners that have a very specific focus within the, the broad spectrum of work that they do in this space. Um, and so I want you to talk about what does organizational justice look like for you and how do you help organizations that you work with to actualize that within their respective organizations? Yeah, so um, it's kind of like a incremental, like stepping into this area. So I chose organizational justice, one, because it's cleaner. <laughs> then diversity, equity, inclusion, and then adding like justice, belonging, a lot of the, uh, the yeah. acronyms are starting right. to become a little bit bigger, but like, um, I, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion specifically operates in the identity realm, right? Like mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot of it's very communicative. A lot of it is, uh, is based on like how we're uh, uh, interacting with each other in the workplace. Um, I wanted to take a much more stru structural approach um, and a strategic approach to kind of this work and creating a foundation for better uh, DEI outcomes. So I started looking at um, different philosophies and then I came across organizational justice at one point. Um, now organizational justice is, is uh, primarily focused on perceptions of fairness in the workplace, but I'm also developing my own model for this. Um, and it revolves around building a, a foundation um, of of uh, basically uh, figuring out ways to distribute power, distribute um, wealth, distribute uh, decision-making capacity in the workplace to achieve better DEI outcomes in the long run. So the idea is to focus on material things, the liberation of your labor to, uh, uh, as a foundation to discuss the liberation of your identity in the workplace, right? So how we do that, um, again, it's, it's still very new for me and I'm still kind of um, uh, moving into this space. But uh, to operationalize it, I have been partnering with uh, a few people um, who are uh, much more kind of adept in the adept in the in the the power sharing space. Um, for example, um, you know, uh, I've been uh, also looking at a lot of different uh, models. Um, sociocracy. Uh, shout out to Ted Rao, who does a lot of great work in this area. Um, is a, is a way of uh, decision making that's shared in the organization. Um, I've been looking at, you know, uh, Aspen uh, Institute, uh, who I know is the, the bastion of capitalism for, for the longest time, but they've been doing a lot of great research on uh, DEI outcomes in, um, in, uh, in, in these power sharing uh, uh, agreements, mostly like worker cooperatives and things like that. There's a lot of great research coming out of France, Spain, Netherlands on this stuff. Um, and so the idea is to kind of go in and, and start anew and fi uh, find ways um, organizationally relevant ways of flattening structurally and culturally to achieve better DEI outcomes. And so um, that's what we're kind of looking at now. Um, again, it's, uh, it's kind of in a, in a new area because I don't find too many um, DEI practitioners are both focused uh, in, in this area, th these marrying these two areas of labor and identity. Um, right. And so I think like uh, as we go along, it's going to be uh, somewhat uh, experimental for a lot of organizations. Um, but it, but you know, I do like, you know, my slate of services for critical equity is still rooted in a lot of traditional DEI practices. This is something that we're, we're like uh, uh, trying out. So I'm not completely uh, expert uh, in, in these uh, power sharing um, uh, uh, frameworks which is why I've been partnering and kind of collaborating and figuring out like, okay, so in what's the difference between um, how DEI looks like in a hierarchical organization right. and then what is the, and then in, in these sort of like organic organizations as they're calling it, um, where uh, power and wealth is distributed, uh, what, you know, what are the DEI in, uh, interventions that require there, uh, that, that are required there. My philosophy is that the latter um, is much easier, uh, uh, even for DEI practitioners, um, because uh, your foundation is structurally sound so that um, the interventions are a little bit different, though it doesn't completely negate the need for a DEI practitioner, right. which we can talk about. Um, and, uh, but, um, but the idea is that uh, once we kind of develop these foundations, the work of the, the, the the weight that is put on your DEI people um, kind of gets distributed. And yeah. it's, it's a lot of different types of interventions which specifically address how we show up in the workplace rather than um, 
you know, are you, are you struggling to make ends meet for your family? Are you struggling to, to kind of uh, have your voice heard um, in the workplace on decisions that affect you in the long run and that kind of thing, so. Right. No, I'm so intrigued by this. And um, as we, again, we're preparing for the top of the hour, um, you and I got into a, a even deeper conversation around your philosophy um, relevant to capitalism and then this work. And I wanna, I wanna go there in just a second, but before I do so, um, I wanna repeat something that you said earlier that was amplified into the chat by Karen Fleshman, which is liberation of your labor as the foundation of liberating your identity. That is, That really is powerful. So I, I agree with you, Karen. Thanks for amplifying That's that. Fair. Um, so let's let's talk about before I get to that very specific question I just referenced. I want to understand from your vantage point because it does sound like this is this is deep and really complex. I don't know how many organizations if they're sitting and thinking about what their needs are and how to um, again operationalize some of, of of their goals. If they can equate it to this has everything to do with organizational justice or the lack thereof. And so we need to consult an organizational justice consultant, right? Mm -hmm. So how, what have you seen as signs for organizations to be able to say, yes, that is something that we need to be leaning into um, so that it becomes then a solution? Um, yeah, so this is where it, I think it takes a little bit of, uh, 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 I guess, discernment um, and discrepancy on my end. Um, I really like you have to you have to be very committed to um, to what I'm specifically talking about here. So like if you want me to come in and do uh, trainings on uh, historical injustice on like uh, uh, how those uh, systems of injustice contribute to how we like, uh, you know, so to how we show up in the workplace and, you know, how like um, uh, the, the, even down to the skills that we have, how we're operating, how we're communicating. I can do that. Right. Um, you're going to, the, but with the caveat that these are all going to be high energy interventions that you have to sustain over time, right? right? You have to continuously coax and fight back against these hierarchies. So, um, so for, for me, I think it, it really requires the organization and leadership being very, very committed to what I'm talking about. And that may be, that may require some degree of sacrifice from leadership. One, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're not going to have the be all end all say in all decision making capacity in the organization. And two, uh, you know, if they don't want to give up the, um, the, the sort of disparity of 350 to one uh, pay, scale, like uh, dif differential, right, like, then it's not going to work. If you're going to give your uh, employees power to make decisions and distribute risk and distribute responsibility, um, you're going to have to distribute pay as well, right? Yeah. You can't just have somebody who's, uh, you lift a lot of weight off their shoulders at the very top and then, and, and but they're still getting the, the rewards of it, right? So these types of, I don't know if you wanna call them sacrifices, um, uh, but like for the most part, um, uh, you have to do this uh, if, if, if you want to truly jump into the full end of what I'm talking about. Now, most organizations are like, look, we want to start out incrementally. We want to culturally flatten, and then we want to uh, figure out ways to structurally flatten. That's fine. Uh, okay, so, um, but the idea has to be that, you know, like, it either, it like, somebody has to drive this. If it's your mm -hmm. leadership or if it's the, organ like, the, the, the uh, laborers in your organization, um, but what I will say, though, is that um, uh, this, what, you know, what I'm proposing is a, is the future of work. I think it's a, it's a survival thing, mm -hmm. right? The more and more organizations are going to take this route of, um, of uh, flattening, of power distribution, of democratizing the workplace. Mm -hmm. It's happening. It's happening all over the world. It's, it's not uh, as much, you know, like the, the speed of it is not as great as it is in Europe, in Western Europe or um, Latin American countries, for example, like, but uh, it is happening. So um, somebody, Karen mentioned Striketober, like we have this whole like quote unquote labor so shortage. We have people not showing up to work because uh, because of the horrible labor conditions that they've been uh, right. privy to like all these years. It's happening, right? It's not like, a, it's not a, a, as we said, pie in the sky sort of thing. This mm -hmm. kind of thing is happening and people um, are one, taking basically there are uh, organizations out there for example project equity 
uh, based out of Chicago, Democracy at Work Institution, um, uh, Institute. Uh, they're helping organizations to laborers to buy out their workplaces, right? Mm -hmm. like, that's one way of doing it. There's multiple ways of doing it. So for me, like, um, you know, there's a lot out there and it's not, it's not like a sort of a idealist thing. It's happening. And I think it's the future of work. And if you want your organization to truly survive, it's going to happen uh, eventually. If you, if you don't, it's probably going to die out. Um, there's also this notion that, uh, uh, you know, when you move to a worker owned uh, um, uh, structure, it tends like it, it has happened before. It saves a lot of work environments. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you distribute power, uh, they find that uh, retention is almost 100% in a lot of these organizations uh, because, you know, what better, uh, who do you answer to but yourself, right? You're, right. you're answering, your power is within your peers. You're having conversations about decisions. Um, bias is distributed, right? It's not, you're not relying, you're not training one individual at the top to check their biases all the time. You're having conversations. So we're, we're actually doing that as a group, as a collective. Um, and so there's a lot of great outcomes for this. And uh, I do wanna say, uh, uh, continue like kind of the, going back to it is that um, one of the final things that I look for is the, uh, like the ability to try, ability to experiment, the idea yeah. that this is iterative. Um, you know, I've worked in local government where some, where, uh, you know, we were doing racial equity work uh, and we were like um, uh, uh, kind of having conversations with other jurisdictions all across the country. And even some of the, the ones that were doing some of the best work were like, like, use us, use our trajectory as an example, but, you know, we still, we're, we're still experimenting. We, nobody has this right. Nobody's doing this oh, correct. Too new. Right? new. Yeah, it's way too new. And so you're trying to unravel hundreds of years of oppressive behaviors and tactics in a matter of a program. It's, it's going to take a lot. It's going to take some time. It, there's, there's going to be some, um, uh, some initial, um, you know, friction, you know, they're, they're, you're not going to get it right uh, on the outset. People like there's going to be some, some, you know, sense of fatigue at some point, like this is way too uh, massive. I'd rather go back to the hierarchy that I've been socialized and indoctrinated into living in. But in the long run, they find that when you do implement these, the, these structures that they have multiple uh, benefits and, and DEI is one of them. And what I'm hoping to do with in my company, Critical Equity, is take this, but also put equity and historical injustice at the forefront. So that is the lens that I'm taking this with, right? I'm not, uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm not for complete universalization, right? I believe that everything has a, a, a historical context, and I believe that your organization um, has its own specific trajectory that it needs to kind of plan out and follow as well. So it has to be organizationally relevant as well. But, um, but doing this through a, an equity lens, mm -hmm. I think is the most important thing for me. Yeah, no, I love that Farzine. And what it reminds me of is that you, I'm sure you have encountered some early adopters that are all on board to be a part of that experiential exercise, knowing that we, it may take a few tries of different strategies before we really can get there. Um, but it sounds like your philosophy is that people or organizations are going to find themselves where, where this is forced upon them, or they're going to be those early adopters and really try to be proactive, realizing that there's value in um, this organizational justice approach and making sure that it is operationalized. So mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about this whole wealth share philosophy relevant to the future of work. And um, sometimes, you know, I have, I have heard people equate it to this open management leadership style, right? And there are pros and cons associated with that. Um, and, and one very specific tenet that I'll bring up to help drive this point home is that sometimes people can see um, that now these organizations who are aligned with this commitment to organizational justice, they have to have um, full consensus around decision making opportunities, mm -hmm. right? And we know that 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 can be problematic. 
And uh, it may not even be able to be fully realized because again, we're just, we're, we're people that have different experiences, different perspectives, and all of that's going to shape the way in which we inform um, mm -hmm. making decisions. And so help us to really understand what this looks like in, in true practice so that we can just get a, a, a better, deeper dive understanding of, of what this looks like um, when it's actualized effectively. Yeah, so um, I think, uh... Uh, there, there's multiple, multiple ways of of democratizing your work environment. Um, uh, when when you're when you're talking about consensus based decision making, um, some organizations elect to uh, adopt, uh, and this this is actually made popular by this sociocracy model that I was that was referencing earlier, is instead of consensus based uh, decision making, you're doing consent based decision making. So everyone not is isn't, and, and you think of voting patterns uh, are different mm -hmm. in uh, various yeah. countries as, as well. Um, you can opt to have your second or third best option, uh, you know, as a as a something that I can compromise on. Right. Um, um, and uh, as opposed to everyone agreeing as their first and they're, they're, they're being uh, tensions. The idea is maybe I don't like get my top here, but like in the future, um, when there is another decision, uh, I can, you know, I can hopefully get uh, the, the top there, but like they're, they're, they're it's not, so I wanna, um, so the, they're, the, the pros and cons aren't in the realm of, is all of this possible? It's it's how it's possible. I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What mechanism um, are you adopting to to have cons to have this sort of uh, democratized decision making? Right um, when you're choosing, uh, uh, you know, where the business is going, or just like choosing, um, you know, how like uh, uh, HR sort of policies that are happening. Um, there are different ways of doing it. Uh, one thing I, I, I also want to add is that like there are these mis misperceptions that um, you are giving you're giving up expertise for the collective decision, right? Like, so in in political science, for example, you have this, um, you know, would you rather have a hundred people work on a on your brain or one neurosurgeon, right? Like, you obviously want to have the person with the expertise uh, who's been trained in that. So. Um, there are mechanisms to build in to kind of highlight and elevate, the, uh, put a platform on expertise. Those individuals who have had years and years of experience that understand these things um, that can move forward. And then uh, also that like, uh, there's this misperception that the, the concept of leadership is completely dissipated, you know, in, yeah. these, uh, in these scenarios. Well, that's not the case. Like leaders emerge, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, I think, uh, and, and uh, part of uh, a lot of what I do is to kind of build the philosophy behind all of this, to be able to kind of implement some of these things. And uh, to backtrack, we have to really understand how power manifests itself. One of the dimensions of power is uh, knowledge, expertise, charisma, personal power is what we call it. Mm -hmm. So um, in, in a situation uh, where like, um, where you, for example, have uh, uh, you know, we're, we're all standing around kind of scratching our heads at a, in an emergency situation. Um, you know, the, we, we will provide platform for that person who has experienced something like this to elevate and maybe guide, right? And that is situational leadership. It is not a defined role. It is not a permanent role, mm -hmm. right? So it is, it is a stepping up in the moment in describing exactly um, what the scenario is and uh, the possible outcomes um, but also there's that, you know, there's, uh, but also like the idea is to train and, and be able to kind of learn to anticipate these things over time. So people are able to kind of uh, tackle um, these issues. I think a lot of the pushback that I receive is like, oh yeah, well, what about emergency situations where we have to have these like very stringent command structures to be able to kind of operate? It's like, no, you don't. I mean, I've, I've worked in local government where, um, you know, there's like a water main break or there's like a, a type of emergency situation and where like if you have one person completely commanding an authoritarian style, mistakes will happen, right? Yeah. That's the whole, that's the whole idea behind psychological safety is that mm -hmm. you need to be able to contribute and say, hey, you know, we forgot this. So yeah. if, if somebody says we, uh, if somebody does that, that person knows and doesn't, uh, doesn't feel comfortable uh, saying that, um, there might be real world and painful outcomes, right? So, um, so there's, I mean, it's, it's like, 
it's not it's not the is this possible it's that it is possible it's like what makes sense uh down to the most granular detail for your organization and um and i want to and i want to definitely like bring it back to um the the realm of dei is that like i encourage all dei practitioners at this point to kind of start looking at uh, these power sharing models because like um for for all of those things that we believe uh is important in the realm of DEI, um, you know, combating problematic behaviors, microaggressions, all these things. Um, if you develop and distribute the, the, the ability to share power, so you, you know, you're not worried about your boss saying something problematic to you, um, you, can, you can address that situation much more easily, right? Um, so there are immense uh, outcomes for what I, you know, and, and Karen highlighted is the, the liberation of your identity, the, the way to authentically show up in, in the organization. And so um, from here, with respect to DEI, my training isn't around, hey, you have to check your biases, you have to, you know, uh, I mean, yeah, you do, don't get me wrong, but it's a different way of doing it. It's, uh, it's like, you, you're not, you're not taking power into account in that, in that way. Like, you know, you're not you, the the your ability to hold your organization accountable is not is not threatening to your prospects of your job or you know possibly getting fired that kind of thing, right? So there is a much much more freeing effect to be authentic, and the whole thing is you're building the foundation and the structure to have psychological safety. It's not a forced thing, right? In a hierarchy it's all intervention based, it's all forced, you have and you have to con consistently maintain it. Um, you know, your leader who has all of this immense risk and responsibility upon them, you know, if th they have to consistently uh, create these environments, and if they're having a bad day, it might all unravel in a day and like somebody gets harmed and, and things like that. Whereas, um, if power is distributed, we're checking one another. Yeah. Somebody can rise to the occasion in, in, in a particular moment and say, okay, so like, you know, um, let's, let's, let's think about this instead. Right. So I hope that answers your question. There's a, I mean, it's, no, it it's, does. You know. and, and I will tell you conceptually, theoretically, it sounds really sound. I think that some people in this audience perhaps could be like me and maybe are wanting to understand a little bit deeper about what is the how to, you know, and does the size of the organization matter? Is that something that um, is, is, you know, needs to be considered in order to really fully actualize this, this model that you're talking about, which is, you know, from your perspective, the model of the future? Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll start with the latter. Um, it is actually uh, possible. There are a lot of organizations, especially I mentioned Spain, particularly the Basque country. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Richard D. Wolf uh, actually um, uh, talked about this, and this is where I, I kind of started uh, getting into this. Um, an organization called uh, Mondragon um, Corporation, uh, based out of Basque country, they have their own university now. Um, Massive, massive organization. I can't remember like the si like the exact size of it, uh, but uh, I believe several thousand uh, employees. Uh, they operate at scale. They contract for major corporations like Microsoft. Um, they're doing very well. Um, so, I mean, I particularly have not worked at that scale before uh, uh, in any of my um, uh, specifically organizational justice work. And DEI, I have, um, but like. Uh, but yes, it is possible, right? The, uh, the, the, thing, the thing next, uh, I think, is for organizations who are operating in this type of scale to be able to um, make sure that they are making these decisions through an equity lens. Um, so it's, it's not simply that democracy and universalization will, um, will erase the injustices of the past. Um, and a good analogy is that, you know, we're all talking about different ways of universalizing healthcare in this country. You know, there's this Medicare for all thing, but is that going, if, if everybody has healthcare, is that going to bridge disparities in race? Uh, uh, not by access, but like how people are receiving treatment. So is that going to affect how doctors are triaging um, pain? Like is white pain worth more than black pain in a Medicare for all situation? 
uh, probably unless you don't address it, right? And it's this whole concept of targeted universalism. You are addressing for those who've been harmed the most um, out of these things and then bridging gaps along with the rising tide, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, long story short, at scale, it is possible. It is, um, uh, it is uh, you know, it's, it's not something that I particularly hold expertise in, in this uh, uh, level, who knows, like, uh, you know, again, like I've been partnering with individuals who do, um, but, um, but yeah, so like, uh, with respect to the, the how to, I think, um, you know, it's, it, it takes a conversation around where your organization is, what you, what you specifically want, and then building out strategies based on, um, the, the types of, uh, models there are out there. Right. And so I think it, you know, like it, it would take a very long time to kind of go through like the, all of the different, like, you know, from uh, we talked about consent-based uh, decision-making. Sometimes, you know, you have a, a representative uh, group, like basically a board uh, makes these decisions. You elect these individuals and then they cycle out based on, you know, confidence of the, uh, the workers. Um, so there, there is, a, I mean, there's a lot. So there's a lot out there, but it, it has to, you know, it has to be organizational development. It has to make sense for you. Most organizations are electing to kind of go through this uh, like sort of culturally flat model, like how can we, but eventually, you know, it comes to a point where like, you know, okay, so we have, we're, we're culturally flat, but what about materially? What about structurally? Like I, yeah. you know, if I'm making these decisions and I'm, I'm involved in this, shouldn't I have reap some of the rewards? So then you move in. So you start talking about profit sharing. So, uh, there's, you know, ESOPs out there, like there's yep. a, uh, different different ways of distributing um, power and eventually wealth. So, um, so that's I think that's that's you know that's where I'm consulting on, and that's where I think the uh, uh, the the different mechanisms is uh, um, is sort of like uh, what you know I, I contribute and I you know I'm partnering with and and being able to kind of uh, get the experts in the room to be able to talk about these models. And then where, where I come in mostly with organizational justice is how these arrangements um, of power distribution lead to these better DEI outcomes, specifically in the realm of equity and justice. Mm -hmm. and, so like, uh, and so like where specifically does, um, does equity fit into the, the, the equation with, with respect to an organic or, or distributed uh, power structure? Yeah, I love how Farzine, you have carved out a very unique niche for yourself that's also worthy of, of people leaning into and exploring and seeing how they may be able to um, activate it, actualize it into their organizations that they are a part of. I also appreciate that you brought psych safety into the conversation a moment ago as well, because I do think that's critical for environments to, to realize um, full equity and justice when people feel safe to bring forth their perspectives and opinions, knowing that there's not going to be repercussions that can negatively impact them. So I want to um, shift to the audience in just a moment after asking this next question, but I do want to invite you to also be prepared to unmute yourself and to share your questions, your thoughts, your reflections, or contributions to the conversation. You can do so that um, by using the raise hand feature in Zoom, or you also can place it into the chat, and we will make sure that we bring that into the conversation. So you've talked about a lot. And Farzine, I want to get you to also reflect on what do you feel is being left out of the broad DEI conversation and why? And this question is more relevant to you outside of what you've already discussed in terms of this deepened understanding of wealth share, power share. What else is left out of the broad DEI conversation? Yeah, and this, the what I'm about to say is not for, for a lack of interest. It's, uh, it's how we're socialized into yeah. these things in this country. Um, and, uh, I think kind of related to what I was talking about is, but like, um, but one of the biggest things that I don't see, uh, happening in DEI, and that's specifically because organizations are afraid to talk about it mm -hmm. and they don't, uh, you know, allow their DEI practitioners to talk about it as much is, is, a, like a fundamental philosophical understanding of our relationship to our own labor, to our output, to our material wealth, to our, you know, how we're relating with our family and what, the output, uh, our outputs are. What is our relationship to that? And what is then our relationship to our identity because of that? So like, um, so I think like a real deep exploration on who really owns our output 
you know, is it, uh, and who owns our calendar, right? Mm-hmm. Who owns like our specific time frame that we are in the workplace? It is literally ownership. It is not, it is not a, it is not a, 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 a negotiation. Uh, the mm-hmm. way things are set up in this country, right? And to be, in, in to, to, to interrogate that understanding um, uh, or, or that framing uh, is going to change how you approach DEI work because, because then it's, it's less of a, um, you know, my, like microaggressions are important and they're, uh, and they're uh, very, very much uh, 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 lead to real world physical and, and, and um, mental harm. But usually uh, where does, like, we're not talking about where does that microaggression draw its power from? It draws its power from history, society, it's, you know, upbringing, my parents, their parents, uh, my ancestors, like, you know, that level of power over time, over history is where we got to, whereas the microaggression is the specific straw that breaks the camel's back in the moment. There is power that it, uh, the, the reason why microaggressions are so harmful is because they reference harm over time. And like, if you're, if you're ha- being harmed repeatedly, repeatedly in the workplace, and then somebody says something like, uh, just irritating, it embeds itself and it hurts. Whereas like, if you're a billionaire and somebody like microaggresses you, like uh, it's kind of like, you know, you can brush it off as e- a lot easier because, you know, you have a support structure, you know, you have, uh, you know, just go sit in your pool, you'll be fine, right? <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm reducing things a little bit, but like, but, uh, but the idea here is that there, is, there isn't this, and, and, and there's a reason for this because, yeah. Because if you if you talk about these things too openly, you might get this fear of quote unquote strike over labor shortage, people not showing up anymore, um, and that's not uh, that's not something that like you know it's it's like yeah it's alarming to the organizations, but you brought this on yourself, right? Wow. Now people finally feel empowered. It's not that uh, uh, it, it's it was going to happen eventually. It just happened to have uh, happened now. We're at the nexus of environmental catastrophe, labor rights, um, feelings of burnout, the uh, pandemic uh, uh, issues, those all con- conspired in the moment to kind of create this um, uh, like sort of uh, intentional backlash, right? Yeah. Um, and I'm saying that this, like, I'm, I'm pro this because, you know, organizations have to, ha- ha- they have to have this message. So what's being left out of the conversation is specifically this. Uh, yeah. It's what you experience in the material, physical world. Um, uh, so like addressing for uh, bad communication is so much easier than delving deep into the roots of your organization, understanding how your practices, policies, and legacies of these practices over time have harmed your employees and why they feel um, that certain things hurt so much, right? Yeah. It's because of these legacies and histories, and those things are what we have to account for. And this is why I, I you know, all of the DEI interventions I've done over time, uh, after a while, started feeling like band-aids, high energy band-aids, right? Because you consistently have to do these things. Um, whereas address the structure, address the system, and you'll have better outcomes. And then, you know, the, the communicative uh, element that is the legacy is the indoctrination, is the mythologies uh, uh, and, and stereotypes and all these things that we've le- been led to believe will show up in this new system, but that is the role of the DEI practitioner now to address that. Mm-hmm. We're not, the DEI practitioner now has to address these um, communicative and ideological uh, uh, kind of uh, things that are floating around in your workplace, but, but it's too much for them to address mm-hmm. the root of it, the system. So like, um, so it, it's got to be, I mean, we have to, we have to, as a society, start talking about the foundation, the roots, you know, we have to talk about revolutionary approaches to this work. Yeah, no, I, d- I definitely agree with that. I think that the most astute practitioners in this space are those who are willing and bold enough to peel back all the layers. Let's get to the root cause and deal with those issues that's, you know, compromising equity, justice, inclusion, and try to solve for it there. And that's, that's not a, that's not an easy feat by any means at all. Mm-hmm. So we do have a couple of questions and one of which is coming from Amy Kingston. And I'm going to assume Amy, that since you placed it into the chat that you want us to present your question on your behalf. So I'll do so at this time. Interesting point of understanding ownership slash output of labor. Can you give us an example of how employers 
would lead such a discussion? Um, it's, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's a good one. And then I, you know, you, you need, I, I think you need an expert in the room, right? Like you can't like, uh, I think it can, it can, it can backfire when you kind of start, uh, throwing options out there without like really being like uh, having the, the knowledge um, because like, you know, uh, like you're doing now and I, I know all of you are doing this is like you're going through what I'm talking about and, and basically trying to think of how does this work at the most minute detail? Like what if this scenario happens? What if that scenario happens? And, um, and so as a consultant, like you've seen a lot of this, but the area, even for us, it's like so new that like, you know, you're going to come across things that you haven't heard uh, from before. So like, um, unless you're completely comfortable with having this, leading this conversation, uh, and you've done like a lot of research on uh, how these things work, like, um, you know, there, there, are, there are people out there, like, for example, like uh, Frederick Lelou, um, he's a consultant, uh, uh, I can't remember where he is, but he, he wrote the book Reinventing Organizations. Um, he talks a lot about this, uh, highly recommended book if, if you're interested in kind of delving into this. Um, there, there are consultancies, uh, mostly in Europe, like there's one K2K, for example, that helps uh, organizations do this transition, which uh, I'm uh, basically there, like, uh, is, a, is somewhat of an inspiration for me. Um, uh, and I think they're also in, in Basque country, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, they, they definitely help organizations transition into these, these models. Um, and they have, they, they're much more uh, uh, sort of, uh, they're less lenient than I am when it comes to distribution of wealth in their organizations. I think they have like a quota of the most, the, the differential between the most paid and the least paid, I think is like 10 or 15%. So it's, it's very, very radical compared to what we have here. Um, but the, but uh, if, if you're going to lead these conversations, probably a good idea to start with uh, kind of looking at uh, some, some experts to come in to maybe have the lead the conversation because you're gonna have a lot of questions. Um, yeah. That, that, you know, it, it might be a little bit too much and it might unravel in the moment. Like, how can we possibly do this? Because like, you know, think about it. We've, we've grown up um, in authoritarian models. All of our, our education system is based on this. Like you have a person with expertise and you know, right. we're all listening. And the question, like, we don't like, the, you know, in some countries they do better at interrogating certain ideas, like raise your hand and challenge. Uh, but uh, from, from, a, from childhood and then we go into the workplace and then, you know, it's very rigid. You have, it's very much an authoritarian structure. You have your leader, CEO, yeah. then you have their, your deputies, you know, C-suite, then you have like middle management and then you have like uh, individual contributors, right? So like, is this not reminiscent of um, religious institutions of the military of like the most like very rigid hierarchies? Sure, you have different philosophies out there about like how to do leadership and human-centered approaches and things like that. But mo most of the time, it's this, it's this rigid leadership. And whatever intervention you have will default back to the structure, right? Even if like you're the most benevolent people on, on earth at the top, um, sooner or later, like the pressure and weight will get to you where you're you, you will make mistakes. And then sometimes that psychological safety in the moment might unravel, right? Um, or those, you know, all the other uh, processes that were, you know, kind of we touched upon. So either, you know, do the research, really understand how like a lot of these things work or bring in a, <laughs> bring in a consultant or a, a, even an expert to, to kind of speak on these things or, you know, there, there are also webinars out there um, that, uh, that are recorded that you can kind of introduce as a, as a, you know, hey, look at this, but don't ask me questions because I don't know, this is new to me too, but like, yeah. yeah. Hope that answers the question. Now, well, I see that um, Anne is here. Anne, yeah, would you, do you have a follow-up question or do you want to, I just want to make sure that Farzine has directly addressed your question the way that you hoped. No, my, my mind has been blown. Thank you for introducing <laughs> that and illustrating because I, I don't have that level of imagination right now where I can even you know, dream about it, <laughs> but it, uh, well, I appreciate I, that. Let me, let me, you do though, you do. Every one of us knows our relationship to our own labor. We all know this in the back of our head, that like somebody owns power over us or somebody has power over us and somebody owns our labor. Somebody owns our time, right? We all interrogate this in all the time, but we've been so indoctrinated and socialized to keep it silent, right? To, to, 
okay, so this is this is just how life is, right? I the 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 the, the thing that I'm doing is just putting language to it. Is like literally, hey, stop and open your eyes. Like we this is unsustainable both for you and for the planet, right? We can't continue these these mechanisms. And so like DEI is extremely high energy and everybody in DEI is getting burnt out. Like everybody that I know that is, does DEI work for more than six months, sometimes even three months is like, I, I came in with this like uh, uh, desire to do good. And yeah. it is just such a massive beast that I have to tackle as a single person in my workplace. I don't feel connected. I don't have the support structure. I don't have the, the, the money behind it to be able to, uh, the resource allocation behind it to be able to do this work. And so um, we all know this. We all know, like, we're not, you know, the ones who are doing well, very well, typically are the ones that may or may not be exploiting other people's labor. Right. We're all in a position where like, we can't, this isn't right. Like this doesn't feel right. You know, um, having to beg your employer to take time off for childcare, mm. that doesn't feel right. Right. I should have ownership of my time and what I produce and my output is something that I'm selling to my employer, not that they own eight, me for eight hours a day. Right. And, uh, and, uh, you know, part of my language, if it, if it's, uh, if it's uh, the, the, the use of the word ownership, I, I, I use it freely. If, it, if it's a little bit troublesome, let me know. But, um, but yeah, it is, it, we all know this, you know? So, um, but yeah, so future, future planning, envisioning things of the future. I think this is very, very important. Um, I'm going about this with the idea that it is iterative, it is experimental, and that's what we have to do. We have to just sometimes leap, but leap with a data led approach. So we don't do, do cause unintentional harm down the road. Like, you know, that's why representation, lots of voices in the room for the stuff is very, very important for somebody to say, Hey, you know, that may work for you, but that's not, that's, that's going to actually cause me harm, that kind of thing. So, but yeah. There's another question we have for Zane and it's um, this, in your client experience, do you see this shift in paradigm as something largely accepted or do you see much pushback from those in leadership? <laughs> the latter to be yeah. frankly honest yeah so, yeah so there's a lot yeah. of pushback right there's a lot mm -hmm. of pushback um but you know i rely on you all and i you know i rely on my peers to normalize this to talk yeah. about this so much that it's so inescapable at some point right like so um i'm talking about it uh for some people it's completely new for others it's it's like yeah, I mean, that's the right way of going about it, but it's never going to happen here, um, right? There's a lot of different sort of like uh, types of pushback that I get, but uh, at some point, we're going to reach a tipping point where this type of conversation is going to be unavoidable. And the more we expose um, uh, laborers and organizations to the fact that, hey, this is actually... Um, being done in a lot of different places like mm -hmm. cooperatives are popping up in the u.s uh you know quite uh heavily and again not at the rate of different parts of the world but it's still as a you know as a as as a workaround so like you know unions uh union penetration in this country is very low so like i think uh, nika we, we said six or seven percent something like that earlier um and even unions are an interim step as a check to these capitalist structures of hierarchy we really want we want our own power in our workplace right we know these things so um but yeah it you know normalize the language talk about it talk about it openly the more we talk about it the more it's going to be inescapable and the more your organizations are going to be forced to have to seek out these things because there's a lot more workers than there are leadership in your organization and if you push for it um it's bound to happen at some point in a, in a collective sort of uh, uh, push. So, yeah. So Farzine, you referenced your book title um, just a few moments ago, and we have someone in our audience that wants to make sure that they captured that. Mm. Um, this is from um, Sheila. I know you've, you've shared a couple of resources. Do you remember the book title? Yeah, it's called Reinventing Organizations by Frederick Lalou. He also has some great, um, I don't know if this is a reverse. Reinventing or Organizations. Yep. So he had, I have the, uh, the, the uh, 
the picture version of it. It's like mm-hmm. sort of a little bit more interactive. He has a like a full book, like uh, just words. Um, but this is the illustrated version. I think uh, I, I, I really, you know, enjoyed it. He's got a lot of great uh, lectures on the, uh, uh, on YouTube as well. I mean, there's a lot of things that I think that uh, the sort of gaps for me um, when, when he speaks uh, uh, as well. I mean, um, he's, he's speaking from his own particular worldview and his own experience. And my whole thing, you know, as leading from coming from a DEI uh, background is that I'm trying to take these models that are popping up, yes. and putting uh, the equity yeah. lens into it and inserting yes. that. Lens. Yes. Uh. Yeah, I just I just placed someone on mute. I saw her that as well. Um, so we're getting to the top of the hour, but uh, if anyone else in this community is like me, your head is spinning because there is a lot to take in. You know, a lot to take in. I'm looking at Samantha's note and the um, the chat, and she's placing a quote around some of the sentiments that you've shared today. I should have ownership of my time and what I produce in my output. It is something I'm selling to my employer. They don't own my time for eight hours a day. And um, I don't want anyone to walk away from this conversation just feeling emboldened immediately without maybe some additional um, tips and being well-equipped for how to navigate that conversation if you're feeling mm-hmm. quite um, you know, liberated to want to do so. And so what would you say for someone who's now been, you know, under your tutelage in this hour <laughs> conversation and they're feeling really empowered to try to broach this with their employer? How, how do you have that conversation? Yeah. So I, I don't like, uh, I appreciate that question. Um, I do want to make sure that you're not in, endangering yourself in the workplace. Yep. So for specifically for people of color, this is something that, um, that, you know, when I'm, co- when I'm kind of having these conversations and coaching, be like, you know, I, you know, it's, a, it, it feels uh, like there's this, and I had this moment too, where it's like this revolution, revelation, it feels like a step into consciousness, like, you know, you're, you're, you're reevaluating um, all these things that you've known for all these years, but somebody at some point has told you it's wrong. And so like, I'm, you know, validating your, so, but, uh, I do want to make sure that um, that you know incrementalism might be a good approach if you're in a, if you're not in a position of power. So um, you don't want to jump into a position where uh, you're ready to you're ready to go, and then that jeopardizes your um, your uh, you know workplace. Or, I'm sorry, not your workplace, but jeopardizes your um, employment yeah. because you have you know you may have a family to feed. You you know you have uh, responsibilities. So Um, so make sure, so like initially the, the idea is for you to kind of, you know, take this and then, uh, kind of, uh, uh, basically in your mind, interrogate what makes sense, take from this conversation, what you need to at this moment. A lot of things that I said may not work for you in the moment. Um, but, uh, but so like, just understand that, uh, I'm basically saying, um, the things that you already know, right. Uh, a lot of you, uh, you know, kind of inherently have experienced a lot of what I'm talking about. It's just that, you know, you, you may not have heard somebody say it out loud. So, yeah. but the idea uh, for this is, um, please, if you're in a position, uh, you know, if you're not in a position of power, um, slowly kind of bring up these things and then figure out, like, and in, in, as you're doing it, as you're interrogating your whole philosophy behind your uh, relationship to your own labor and to your own identity, um, you know, try not to kind of, I'm doing this because we're, we're in a room full of peers, uh, you know, everyone's receptive to this and receptive to these ideas, but not everybody might be in your organization. So first, you know, look out for you. Um, yeah, no, I so appreciate that. And I know that there are many in this community that are probably sitting back thinking, I'm not even sure what it looks like to tell my employer that you don't own my time. Because what is the alternative to that? What, what, I mean, what are we really saying when we are um, feeling empowered to broach this conversation? What are we saying? That now when I am on the clock per se and I'm executing certain tasks, which may result in a, a product or a report that now that's mine, that's not the company's, what are we saying exactly? Yeah. So let me go back a little bit. So that, I mean, that's my job. That's my job to come in and, and kind of tell yeah. leadership that this is, this is what, so when you take the, the, the power and you're, you might receive some pushback. So there's this entire different conversation to be had around what if there's so much pushback that it's like, it's, it's harmful or not. So um, 
without going into, well, leave your employer, that kind of thing where like, you know, not everybody can do that. Of course, that's a very privileged thing to say. Um, the idea uh, is uh, societally for us to create these situate the, the, this parallel institutions where we can go into them or start one your own or start them on your own right. and so like the majority of cooperatives actually are people think that it's people like employers buying out their uh, organization but no they're startups um yeah. there's there's a great like uh actually there's a great uh uh organization um I, did, but I believe the website is start.coop that they actually help organizations start up cooperatives right because mm -hmm you know, a lot of us don't like want to work in this situation, but don't want to uh, like be the, you know, the, the lead because it's too much risk in this front. So you distribute, well, like, um, but so, you know, we don't, so there, there's a different conversation where they're reforming our institutions and then creating parallel institutions to, you know, that'll eventually overwhelm these rigid hierarchies. Right? Mm -hmm. So if we're creating more just and equitable organizations out there, more and more people will be drawn to that. And hopefully it'll you know, suck the life out of these problematic places, right? So, um, so I think that uh, uh, creating, creating these parallel um, yeah. organizations, and maybe that's something that y'all do. Maybe it's something you talk about amongst yourselves and like, hey, we, can, we, can, we know this work, we're, we're veterans in this field, we can do this ourselves and we can all benefit from it, so. Yeah. Well, one thing for sure is that we won't solve it today, but definitely you have um, provided good ground for us to um, follow our curiosities and to learn more and to dig deeper. So we do appreciate that, Farzine. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for saying yes to our invite. And I know this community certainly has um, gained a lot of value from hearing your perspective. And uh, we hope that each of you have a wonderful and safe weekend. Hopefully we'll see you back next Friday as we welcome Rico. And uh, thank you all just for joining. We really do appreciate it. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you all for having me. Thank you.